Hello. In this video, we learn a new skill called solving a system of equations with matrices. So we apply a new technique to the same old problem and see how technology can save us a lot of time. Let's get started. So what is a matrix? No, not the movie. A matrix. Well, a matrix is just an array of numbers. So we're not going to have any variables, just numbers. It is defined, first of all, by its size. When I say the size, I mean its number of rows and its number of columns. So here, M, the first number here, let me get a color for us. The first number that we are referring to is M. Oops, I lost my, there we go. M, where M is the number of rows. So rows by columns. We always go rows first, columns second. Okay, and N is our number of columns. So for example, suppose we have matrix A. We usually use capital letters like A, B, and C for our matrix names. So suppose we have matrix A, and the entries of the first row are 2, 5, and 7, and the entries of the second row are negative 3, 8, and 1. Well, we would say, since we have two rows and three columns, that this is called a 2 by 3 matrix. Just like you would say if you had a rectangle which had a length of 2 feet and a width of 3 feet, we would say that rectangle has dimensions 2 by 3, or 2 feet by 3 feet. Same idea here, but row always comes first and column second. Now, as far as some notation, just so you're familiar um, with how we're going to present the entries of a matrix, usually if you have a capital letter A, that's the name of your matrix, we would use the lowercase letter A to talk about the entries of that matrix, so specific entries in the matrix. So for example, entry A11, little a sub 11, is referring to the entry in the first row and the first column. So in this case, that would be the number 2. Entry A12 would be the entry in the first row, second column. So that would be the number 5. So feel free to pause the video and type in or write down uh, your own answers here. The next one would be 7, negative 3, 8, and 1. Right? Those are kind of easy to see once you see the pattern. We're doing row first, column second. Now, what is this about? Right? What do I care about an array of numbers? Well, they have many, many useful um, properties, and they tell us they describe many different phenomena. For us, we're going to use them to describe a system of equations, uh, typically. But if you go on in math, if you're going to be an engineer especially, or a mathematician, not many of you out there, but some of you, you will end up taking a class called Linear Algebra. That will basically give you a lot more information about matrices and their uses. For us, though, the main focus will be applying them to systems of equations. So for example, the matrix A described on this slide could be what we call an augmented matrix. Augment means to enhance, so we've enhanced the coefficient matrix of a system. For example, suppose we had the system below, 2x plus 5y equals 7 and negative 3x plus 8y equals 1. Well, I could rewrite that system of equations, the linear equations only, not, not anything higher than 1, but I could rewrite this as an augmented matrix by noticing that the x column would go first, the coefficients of x, the y column would go second, the coefficients of y, and it's usually good form to put a little line here, separating your coefficients from your constants on this side. And what we can then use eventually is technology. We can ask the calculator or desmos.com or lots and lots of different um, sites, websites. You can enter the entries of your matrix and ask the technology to perform operations which would allow us to get our answers to this system. Okay? So it'll be another alternative way of solving the system using technology or doing matrices by hand. All right, well, let's take a look at some more information about matrices on the next slide. Well, if you remember from a previous video, when we were studying systems of equations in three variables, oftentimes it was helpful to be able to back substitute answers from a previous uh, equation into a pre prior equation in order to solve a system. And that was most useful to us when we had something called triangular form. So if you go back to our previous video, we discussed that. We could back substitute and get our answer there. Well, the way that we would describe that graphically in a matrix would be something called row echelon form. So row echelon form is like the matrix version of triangular form. Row echelon form, which I'll refer to typically as REF, and so will your calculator technically, it's an augmented matrix, meaning it has more columns than rows, but because we've included the constant column here. It's an augmented matrix that is describing our system, but in a way where we always have ones on the diagonal going from left to right, from top to bottom there, and below those ones, we always have zeros. So we get a zero below each of those ones, okay? 
Once we have ones along the diagonal and zeros below, we'll declare this to be in row echelon form or REF form. The reason it's very helpful again, so for example, this system here, with first, this matrix rather, matrix A with the first row 1, 1, 1, 4, second row 0, 1, negative 2, 4, third row 0, 0, 1, negative 1. That would be what we call REF form, row echelon form. Because again, we have the ones on the diagonal from left to right going down and zeros below those ones. So that is REF form. Why is it so useful? Well, it represents, again, a system x column, y column, z column, constants, right? So if I know that that's an augmented matrix representing a system of equations, of linear equations, I could rewrite that system as 1x plus 1y plus 1z must equal 4. That's my first row represented as an equation. 0x, well, I don't need to write that, plus 1y minus 2z equals 4. So that would be my second equation coming from the second row of the matrix. And finally, there's no x, there's no y, but 1z equals negative 1. And that's my third equation that is read off from this third row of my matrix. So once I have that, we did this example, I think, previously. We can back substitute, and we ended up getting our solution set in our previous video, if you remember, of 3, 2, and negative 1. So we did it a different way in the past, but now we could use a matrix to interpret that solution. Okay. Now the question you might be having, maybe you haven't had it yet, but it might be coming soon, hopefully, is okay, great, but are all matrices going to already be in row echelon form, REF form? If you're thinking that, you're on the right track. And the answer, of course, is no. But just like not all systems of equations were in triangular form originally, we always are able to do Gaussian elimination or row operations to make it happen. So let's take a look at how we can do that legally on our next slide. So what are the legal row operations that we're allowed to do in order to get our REF form? Well, just like we mentioned with equations, we're now applying this to matrices. First of all, we can always switch rows. You're always allowed to swap rows. So for example here, the way we write that typically is R sub a number, so like R sub 1, R sub 2, or R sub 3, with double arrows connecting them, meaning row 1 might switch with row 2, or vice versa. That literally just means you're switching the order of the equations. Doesn't change anything in the system, but it does make it easier to get ones on the diagonal sometimes. For example, below here, I've given you a matrix, an augmented matrix, size 3 by 4, with first row 2, 3, 1, 4, second row 1, 2, 0, 3, and third row 0, 0, 1, negative 1. And I've asked you to perform a row operation, that's what these are called, row operations, where you see R1, double arrow R2, meaning R1 and swap. Literally that means cutting and pasting basically. So let's take a look at who's changing in that row operation. Well row 2 becomes the old row 1. So now this row 1 is 1, 2, 0, 3. And row 2, and they switch. Row 2 becomes row 1, row 1 becomes row 2. So the new row 2 is the old row 1. 2, 3, 1, 4. Notice what did not change was row 3 in this case. 0, 0, 1, and negative 1. So all I've done here is I've demonstrated one possible row operation. Why would that be helpful? Well, if our goal is to get ones along the diagonal, now I have a 1 in entry 1, 1, in the first row, first column, which would be helpful in the process of getting ones along the diagonal. Now, there's a couple of other ways I could have done that. The second opportunity that you are always allowed to use option you're allowed to use, is you can multiply a row by any number, as long as that number is not zero, right? If you multiply a row by a zero, you completely eliminated one of your three constraints, and you're not allowed to do that. You have to satisfy them, not eliminate them, okay? So you're allowed to multiply any row by any number that's not zero. So how would that be useful? Well, maybe instead of switching rows one and two at the beginning, you decided, I'm just going to multiply row one by what number? That's right, 0.5 or 1 half. Notice that that would change all of the entries, though, in that row. So you'd get 1, 3 halves, 1 half, and 2. I don't like to work with fractions unless I have to. So I would probably avoid multiplying by half. I would rather switch the rows if necessary. The third possibility, though, that you're always allowed to do is you're allowed to multiply, sorry, you're allowed to combine or add multiples of rows together. And that's what we're saying here. You can multiply a row by some constant. Then you could add it to some other row and put the result in whichever row you like. Okay? So for example, another way that you could have made 1 appear in that first 
entry 1, 1, you could have multiplied, let's see, how about you could have multiplied row 2 by negative 1 and added it to row 1. So you'd end up adding 2 plus negative 1, which is 1. But notice you'd have to do that with every entry, okay? So that would affect more than just the one number. Okay, so now that we have under, um, we've agreed to at least, the terms of, of engagement, if you will, we are allowed to swap rows, we're allowed to multiply rows by any number that's not zero, and we're allowed to add multiples of rows together. Can't do anything except for those three row operations. That's what we mean by Gaussian elimination. Okay, so let's get started applying these rules of engagement, if you will. Example one, it says, could you solve the system using Gaussian elimination with matrices, and that's a distinction, if they don't say with matrices, then you're using the old principles of just substitution and elimination, right? But as soon as they say using matrices to get row echelon form or REF form, now this is that idea where you're trying to get ones on the diagonal and zeros below. So I like to write down my goal when I'm doing anything in life. If you don't know where you're going, you're just going to be wandering around. So what is my goal? My goal is to take my augmented matrix, which is currently a 3 by 4 matrix, Entries in the first row of 2, 4, 1, 5, 1, 1, 1, 6 for row 2, and 2, 3, 1, 6 for row 3. And I would like to rewrite it after doing my row operations, as many as are needed, so that I get 1s along the diagonal and zeros below. That's the goal, right? I would like 1s along the diagonal, zeros below. Notice I don't care about anything else. I don't care about what's above the diagonal and what's to the right in the constant column, okay? Whatever I end up with in those places will help me to get triangular form and back substitute. Okay. Now I will make a note here in your homework or if you do some extra reading outside of this video, there is something called Gauss-Jordan or Gaussian-Jordan elimination. What that refers to is doing a couple of extra row operations to make the numbers above the diagonal equal zero. You're welcome to go through that process, but it, it will take more time, and then you'll get the solution sticking, sitting right at you. It'll be staring right at you. Um, so that's another option, but I won't require that of my students. If you can get REF, you can back substitute, and you're golden. But your technology could do both, REF or reduced row echelon form, which is RREF. Okay, so let's get started. So I notice here that I have a 2 in entry 1-1 one, one, in the first row, first column, but I'd like it to be a 1. So how am I going to handle this to make it a one? Well, again, a couple of options. Well, three options to be precise. I could multiply a row by any number, like one half. I could add multiples of rows together, or I could simply switch the rows. And that's what I'm gonna opt for here. I chose to switch rows one and two. So let's see what that would produce. My new row one would be one, 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 six. And my new row two would be two, four, one, five. Notice that the old row three is unchanged in this step, in this row operation. Two, three, one, six remains. Okay, so I now have at least the one where I wanted it, in entry one, one. Good job, us. Okay, next thing we want to do is get a zero below. So how would I begin the process of getting a zero below? I'm after a zero in that location. Well, a couple of options again. I can multiply by a number, but that wouldn't be the best option because I can't multiply by zero. But I could add multiples of rows together. So maybe, for example, you're thinking, huh, below it I have another 2, if only one of them was negative, right? So maybe you say, could I multiply a row by a negative 1 and then combine it with another row? Yes, you can, okay? So whether you like to call it row 2 minus row 3 or row 3 minus row 2, either one is fine, but you want to be careful um, thinking of future steps, right? So for example, I'm going to choose to do row 2 minus row 3 at this step. So let's take a look. Row 2 minus row three and put the result in row two. So where would I be here? Well, that would mean that row two is changing. Rows one and three are unchanged. So I'm just gonna copy them from the previous step. One, 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 and six for row one, and two, three, one, six for row three. The new row two is what's changing here. And here's how we're getting it. We're going to take row 2 minus row 3. In other words, we're multiplying row 3 by negative 1 and adding it to row 2. Okay. This would mean I'd have 2 minus 2 for this entry, producing 0, which is what I wanted. 4 minus 3 for the next entry, producing 1, which is very nice. 1 minus 1 for the next entry, which is 0. Okay. And 5 minus 6 for the next entry, which is negative 1. So that's pretty awesome because in the process, since we were forward thinking, 
And with practice, you'll become a forward thinker, hopefully. We now have not only the zero that we were after, below that first one, but we also ha happen to stumble upon a one to its right in the middle on the diagonal, which is excellent. If we hadn't done it in that order, if you had done row three minus row two, you probably would have ended up with a negative one. Now you might be wondering, oh no, what do I do? It's okay. You can always multiply a row by a number that's not zero. So you can multiply that entire row in your next step by negative one. So if you took that course of action, you still have a way out, okay? Now at this step, we are going to head down to row three. In row three here, let me pick a color that you can see. Here we go. In row three here, we are after the two, right? We would like that two to be a zero. So to make that happen, using the row above it wouldn't be very useful because it's zero. But I could use row one. What could I multiply row one by? That's right, negative two. Negative two times row one added to row three, and I'll put that result in row three. So let's see what that would produce here. Rows one and two are unchanged, so feel free to just copy and paste those. 1, 1, 1, 6 for row 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1 for row 2. And finally for row 3, we would have our new entries. Negative 2 times row 1, that's going to be a negative 2. Adding to row 3, that's negative 2 plus 2, which is 0. For the next entry, I'd get negative 2 plus 3, which is positive 1. For the next entry, I get negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. And for the last entry, negative 2 times 6 is negative 12. Adding that to 6 gives me negative 6. Good job. Okay, so where are we going? What's the goal? That's why we wrote it down above, right? We want to have 1s on the diagonal and zeros below. We're so close. We have the zeros below the first one, but now we need the zero below that second one. So how can we turn that 1 into a 0? Well, again, we can add multiples of rows together. So you could use row one, but what would be the problem with that? Oh, that's right. You would mess up your zero, wouldn't you? So instead, we're going to use row two above it because it has a zero above the other zero. So let's see. Should I do row two minus row three, row three minus row two? What looks better to you? I agree. Row two minus row three. Let's do it. Row two minus row three. Notice we already did that operation earlier, but now it's with different numbers, so it has a different result, doesn't it? We're putting our result into row 3, and we'll copy and paste rows 1 and 2. They're unchanged. 1, 1, 1, 6, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Okay, now let's get our row 3, our new row. So row 2 minus row 3, what does that mean? Well, 0 minus 0 is 0. 1 minus 1 is the 0 we were hoping for. 0 minus a negative 1 is actually 0 plus 1, which is 1. Okay, again, if we had gone the other way, we'd have a negative, and we can multiply by negative 1. Finally, we have row 2 minus row 3, for, so this would be negative 1 minus a negative 6, which is really negative 1 plus 6, or 5. Okay, now we are in what we call row echelon form, where we have 1s on the diagonal going down from left to right, and zeros below. Why do we love that so much? Because it's really triangular form. Notice that the system of equations that we're really describing with this REF matrix is 1x plus 1y, I'm looking at row 1 right now, plus 1z, those are my coefficients of each variable, equals the constant 6. In the second equation, there's no x or z, but there's 1y and it's supposed to equal negative 1. And in the last equation, there's no x or y, but there's 1z, and it is supposed to equal 5. So for my solution set, I already have two of the variables staring at me. I have that z is 5, and I have that y is negative 1. Your last step is to simply plug in those letters, sorry, those numbers, rather, both of those numbers, back them into equation 1, and you will get your answer, and that would be that x is equal to 2. From back substitution, you'll get that answer. So then you could plug all three numbers in and see that you're right and feel really good about yourself. This is one example. Again, you can pause it and rewatch it as many times as you like. You can always email me or stop by my office if you have questions. But you're going to need to practice, practice, practice to feel good with this, to feel comfortable with this skill. So again, good luck. I'll see you next time. Happy practicing. And math is not a spectator sport. Good luck.